Okay, so um, today we are going to talk about imposter phenomena through your teaching practices from the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching at Stony Brook University. Um, first, we will um, introduce our co-facilitators today. Um, my name is Jenna Kim. I am a postdoctoral associate at CELTS, and we have... Hi, my name is Jenny and I'm instructional designer at CELT at Stony Brook. And we have our co-facilitator, Devin. Do you want to introduce yourself, Devin, real quick? Sorry, yes. Hi, I'm Devin. I'm a graduate student assistant at CELT. Um, I'm one of the co-facilitators for this panel. Thank you. Um, we just want to take the time to also thank Kimberly Kennedy, our librarian who created our LibGuide today. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask Devin to kind of copy and paste that LibGuide link to our chat real quick. We also have Noah Lee today as our live transcriber. And thank you, Noah Lee, for transcribing today. Um, and as, as I mentioned earlier, we are going to record this session and after this panel discussion is over, we will send um, the recording link. So, um, oh, CELT, our Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching, focuses on excellent teaching through collaboration with instructors. We try to create a space for cross-disciplinary conversations about excellent teaching. Um, we believe that inclusive teaching is part of excellent teaching, and so this is why we have our inclusive teaching panel discussion every month. Um, just to give a little bit of introduction of how this is going to work out, um, please make sure that before you speak, you we would like you to introduce your name and make sure that your name is visible in your on your Zoom screen. We would like people to speak, one, one speaker to speak at a time. Um, but essentially, if any participants have questions or would like to comment on anything, please utilize the chat. And as I mentioned earlier, um, please turn off your, your video and audio so that we can um, give a, a good quality recording at the end of this session. And we would also like to introduce our panelists for today. Um, I will ask Danielle to start off to introduce herself. Good morning, everyone. My name is Danielle Marola. I am a clinical psychologist, and I'm currently the associate director at the Center for Prevention and Outreach, um, where we really are looking how to support this beautifully diverse community's health, well-being, safety, and connection. Um, so. Thank you for all being here. Thank you. And Mariah? Hi, I'm Mariah Nagan. I'm a professor of practice in chemistry. So I teach general chemistry too. And then I'm a, also associate dean for curriculum in the College of Arts and Sciences. Thank you. And we also have Lisa Marie. Hi, everyone. I'm Lisa Marie Nisbet. I'm a postdoctoral scholar here at Stony Brook University. I work in the lab of Dr. Jessica Seeliger, and I'm an Arakta postdoctoral scholar. So that means that I engage in both research and teaching. Thank you everyone for being here today. Um, we will just briefly introduce how this discussion is going to be organized. Um, it's going, going to be very much of just a, you know, a natural dialogue and discussion, but we wanted to um, set up a little bit of structure in it. Um, Jenny will introduce that and take it over from here. Thank you. So, um, so let's start. What is the impasta phenomenon? It's like, uh, uh, that's why people are here for today. This was actually a concept introduced in uh, 19, 1987 by Clans and Imes, and uh, they did a research on over 150 high achieved uh, successful women. And they find out that although they've been highly achieved, they don't uh, seem to internalize their success. So they feel like they are kind of um, um, don't deserve for in their position. 
And uh, so that's how they come up with that, this idea. And also there is an instrument developed to measure the IP. Uh, we would provide the link here. So now let's start with the poll. Um, have you ever uh, experienced IP? Wait, it, can you see it? No? Yes, we can see it. Great. So I'll give you like two minutes. Okay, so let's see the results. Can you see on the screen? No, uh, but that's okay. If if not, we can do that on the chat. I see the here. results. Okay, great. I can't, I don't know why it's on my end. It's not working, <laughs> but that's okay. So 91% of people said yes. said yes, and 9% said not sure, and no one said no. <laughs> That's very amazing. So things, it has become so evident that uh, IP has been uh, something that so many of us have. So it is really worth our time and the effort to take a, a close look of this uh, phenomenon. So let's start with the questions. Um, can any of our panelists tell us a little bit about your experience with IP in your career? I'm happy to go. Um, you know, I, I think even based with those numbers, uh, it's clear that, um, you know, many of us, if not all of us, have experienced IP uh, at one point in time. Um, and the fact is that although those initial studies uh, were speaking to white women, um, at that point, they were among the first to kind of infiltrate like the kind of white corporate world. Um, and so that is where those numbers are coming. But the fact is, um, this is something that that really goes across the boards in all sorts of ways. And I know we'll get more deeply into that, but I, I wanna say for myself, um, as a, a white woman, but also with a very strong, like Italian uh, background, um, you know, there was a certain idea of what I should be doing. Um, and I kind of went in a, a different direction. So there was always kind of this internal conflict um, in that way. Uh, but um, moving into various areas, whether it was in um, I don't really remember my undergrad that well, but uh, graduate school. Um, and then beyond that, uh, up until really, you know, very recently, I mean, I think IP or some form of that has seeped in um, and it has, you know, really required me to recognize that a lot of these kind of internal narratives, a lot of the self-doubt has been ingrained within me um, and, and and being able to kind of decipher that and, and look at my body of work, what I do. Um, and be able to acknowledge all of myself. So yes, absolutely. Um, so much so that I, I would have to say like early on in my like graduate school career into like perhaps my earlier uh, kind of earlier career uh, career experiences, it, it there were times where it, it was like debilitating. Um, so yes, for me, absolutely. I guess I'll, I'll just say, um, if you ask my husband, who's also a chemist, he'll say, I've never experienced imposter syndrome because my outward appearance is this confident, like I'm in charge sort of person. But the truth of the matter is <laughs> that um, I'll go, 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 go. And then there'll be moments like I'm the only woman in quantum. I'm the only person of color and I'm the only woman in my quantum class. And I think of myself as pretty good at math and I'm doing my work and I don't, I'm, I'm really stuck. 
for hours and hours. And so I asked my fellow classmates, oh, hey, how, do you, how did you do that problem? And they're like, oh, you're so wrong. And then you figure out that in fact, a week later, you were totally right. They didn't know what they were doing. And so there's lots of instances of this throughout my career. Um, that's one of my student ones, <laughs> but, but it, it, it's always there. And like Danielle said, you kind of always have to just say, oh, that's there. Okay, how are we gonna regroup? Thank you. So Lisa Marie, do you have anything to share? Um, I would definitely say that I would be echoing what Danielle and Maria just said in the sense that, oh, Mariah just said, sorry, in the sense that, yes, there's always the moments of self-doubt. I think for me, I, so there's multiple layers for me, right? Like I'm an immigrant from the Caribbean, I'm black. And, you know, as you move up the ladder with degrees, you go from undergrad to graduate to, you know, post-grad where you now get a PhD and now you're working in the field, there's less and less people of color. So you have that issue of representation that's not there. But then on top of that, you now have this extra personality, you know, this extra layer of not being from this country. So there's additional nuances that sort of, influence how you have to navigate and then you get that additional perception of oh this person is not from this country oh you know I'm doing things a particular way am I doing it the right way because everybody else is doing it a different way am I the person who's not correct here only to find out that I'm taking the right approach it doesn't matter you know where you're from background wise what matters is how you address the particular situation because there's just certain things that have to be addressed that way but I also feel like as a woman in society, you're sort of like encouraged to question yourself. Men, I feel like not all the time have that avenue or that 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 level to explore because they're just told, oh, you can be confident about this. But some, but somehow as a woman, sometimes that point is not addressed where you're also encouraged to be confident. You're also encouraged to to believe in yourself as much as you could, right? So I would definitely say continually imposter syndrome or phenomenon is something that I'm constantly dealing with on a daily basis, on a monthly basis, right? On a weekly basis, right? And as a scientific researcher, there's lots of room for you to have imposter phenomenon and have to keep working through it. Like from having, coming up with experimental ideas and then being told no, but then somebody else echoes that exact same idea and then they get told yes you question well what is it that's happening here so but yeah yeah thanks I just want to I'm sorry I, I think you know Lisa Marie you really kind of uh, address like the layers and the intricacies of it all really well particularly how you know we are judging our intersectional pieces based on societal constructs that were created by people who don't you know look like us um and and the manner in which this really is so embedded in like systems and how we're constantly you know and, and again some more than others right uh because there are things that some are experiencing like you're saying every day and are coming up on uh, across every day um and again these are socially um, ascribed constructs that were created not by us, that yeah. we are constantly comparing ourselves to. So I think you really explain that in, in a lovely and uh, honest fashion. Thank you. Thanks. Actually, I have a question for the terminology. Like most people would, uh, I heard a lot more of uh, imposter syndrome than imposter phen phenomenon. So what's your take on the, which one should be better way to describe it? That is for Daniel. You are the psychologist. <laughs> well, definitely imposter phenomenon. Um, it, it's not like when we say syndrome. Obviously, there's no. It's not in our DSM. It's not in our diagnostic manual. Um, but I, I think the problem too when we're saying syndrome is that we are now placing the blame or the onus on the individual, like it's coming from that individual. And I, I really um, believe strongly that yes, it's the individuals that are experiencing the impact, but it really is the society, the systems that really should be 
um, addressed and, and more overtly spoken. So I'm, I'm all about that. If it's going to be identified at all, phenomenon um, would be uh, the important construct. Thank you. So how would you uh, address IP in your teaching? So um, I teach, I don't know, anywhere from 200 to 1300 students a semester. <laughs> and a lot of them come from different backgrounds. Um, I have a few things to say, so I don't want to hog the whole time. But <laughs> um, one of the things I like to do is encourage them, uh, give them opportunities to form confidence. Like sometimes it's the question that I ask in class, like I, I know that they know the answer. Um, Sometimes, so it's about the tone that I set in class. And sometimes it's about, um, like, even though I teach general chemistry, so these students, I ask them what backgrounds they're from, and kind of, a lot of them are pre-med for lots of reasons. But anyways, I try to talk to them about what's their future and how are you going to get there? And then I tell them that there are these internships for research um, at companies, um, study abroad, and I talk to them about what the qualifications are, and I kind of recalibrate what the qualifications are, because I think a lot of students feel like um, they're really high level. You have to have a, like a 4.0 GPA. You have to be the best at everything in order to even apply, and so sometimes I just talk about how, you know, you want to be average. You want to be interested in the topic. You want to do a little homework. Um, Someone asked if I could speak more about the environment. So uh, one of the things that I learned, so I've got this class of imagine 570 students. It's a giant lecture hall and there's a balcony and all things can happen in the balcony. And then there's like this group in the front that's fairly confident, right? They're sitting in the front. And what I found from talking to them individually is that they're bullying each other. So for instance, uh, I try to have this very like free sort of classroom environment and so I'll say, um, does anyone have any questions? I'll pause. And I'll pause for a long time. I'll say, are you sure? This is a really hard topic, you know, to try to encourage them. And I'll say positive things if they do ask a question. And one time I heard that the student would ask a question and then the other students next to them would say things like, I can't believe you're asking that question like, you know, just like quietly while that person was asking the question. And, uh, and she came and told me afterwards. And so I stood up on stage and I said, with my microphone, I'm recorded. <laughs> I said, um, I heard that some of you are not being kind. And I want to tell you that that's not what we do in chemistry. This is a course for everyone. And we all, all the A students get there because of other people. You know, I try to set the tone by saying, we're all in this together. This is a hard topic. And if you can't be cooperative, we don't want you here. <laughs> Readjust your attitude. Um, so that's something I do. The other thing, like this semester, I have the off sequence students and they tend to be really meek and not sure of themselves. And after the first exam, they didn't do very well. So I said to them, I've noticed that after COVID, you aren't asking as many questions as I would like you to. And I said, I want you to know that there are so many of you that I have no idea what your grades are. So when you ask a question, all I think is, wow, what a smart person. What an engaged person. They care about this material and then they're asking a question. And after I said that, all these students came up to me after class. Maybe they didn't ask in class, but they came up after class and they asked all these questions. And then I you know, was really encouraging with them. And so now they're starting to ask questions in class. Um, so that's what I, I guess I, I mean about the time, the, the tone that you set the kindness um, and using your authority as the instructor to say this is a cooperative environment. Thank you. 
Um, so how about uh, Lisa Marie, do you have anything to share about how you are uh, addressing the IP in your classroom? So I absolutely agree with everything Mariah said with setting the tone and encouraging the students to ask questions and letting them know that um, they're, we're all in this together. Um, to add to what she's saying, another thing that I generally try to do is let the students know that the space that they're in in the classroom is safe and it's inclusive, which means it's open for everybody. And I, I also, you know, in my most recent teaching experience, had difficulty getting the students to engage. And it wasn't, and, and I thought because they weren't openly asking questions and or volunteering answers when I asked questions that they either were not getting the material or they just weren't interested or you know there was other problems that were happening turns out the students were engaged but they just didn't necessarily have the skill set to articulate themselves because they were in the middle of COVID they were online they didn't have to engage with anybody right so I was just like, okay, well, one way that I can work around this problem is to implement an active learning strategy, which we call Think Share Peer, right? Where I ask a question and for students who are not comfortable, who are not confident, they get to be paired up with somebody, they get to discuss their answers, they get to exchange ideas and perspectives. And then collectively, they can either both volunteer their answers or they can decide well, one person will volunteer their answer. So for me, I was like, okay, building self-confidence demonstrating to them that they actually know the material, having them also build a sense of community for themselves. So now they now have a peer mentor network that they can depend on such that, that they, the onus doesn't just fall only on the professor, but now they now have to have some self-reliance. They can build their self-confidence. And also my perspective of trying to get them to engage with other students is to help them to be more confident with articulating themselves and engaging in science communication, but also teaching them how to respect other people, right? From diverse backgrounds, who have diverse perspectives, who see things differently, who understand things differently to, you know, to really help them become better integrated. I think, you know, in addition to Mariah's approaches, the approaches that I take as well have been super helpful in helping to like quell the imposter phenomenon and actually truly show the students that they have all the skill sets that they need and whatever they don't have, they can build in that class and then progress from there. So that's usually the, the approach that I take when it comes to teaching and addressing imposter phenomenon in the classroom. Yeah, actually, I, I want to add, um, Lisa, I, Maria, I completely agree this group, sometimes they don't say it all. So. <laughs> Um, but um, Inesta Reed kind of, um, asked a question in the chat and it, it directly kind of combines what you said, Lisa Marie, with um, what I actually didn't say. So um, to give Inesta Reed credit here, she says, instead of using open-ended questions, do you, like, do you have any questions? Do you think asking different levels of questions will bolster student confidence? Sort of using Bloom's taxonomy, for example, asking, knowledge-based questions to create in an open environment and then picking up the stakes by adding comprehension and analysis questions. Um, so uh, I should say that half of my class is me lecturing, but half of my class is group work. So I, I do take the Lisa Marie um, perspective. So what we'll do is we'll do sort of a higher analysis comprehension question in the broader group. So I have 200 students in my class right now and they're all sitting next to somebody. I let them kind of do these loose groups. In recitation, they have more structured groups, but in class, they have these loose groups of who you're sitting next to. But we'll do an open-ended question like some like five-step problem, <laughs> some very difficult problem. And um, I might say something like, well, think <laughs> with your about how you might, or your group, about how you might start this problem. Something really simple, like, oh, well, what do I know? Like you're reading the question, what do I know? And, and you do have to give them time. So it might take 15 minutes to do a problem. That process of building camaraderie in the classroom and making everybody feel like they have something to contribute um, takes a lot of work. Um, but the other thing that I do is I walk and I have TAs that walk, undergraduate TAs, and we walk 
quietly <laughs> amongst the group. So you've asked this question and you've said, well, can you construct a diagram, like a concept map for how you would solve this? What would you start with? You know, we might brainstorm and then I'll let them go. And then I'll walk quietly amongst the group and talk to them and then get them when I think everybody's kind of on the same page, then I might say, okay, well, does anyone want to share how they're going to solve this problem? You know, and then different people will add in their input and then we'll say, okay, now that you think you know the strategy, why don't you go? And again, they go in back in groups. And then again, we talk about, well, how did you get there? What did you get for that answer? You know, um, so sorry, I'm talking. Danielle, do you want to add anything? No, I, I think this is great, but I just want to add kind of validity with both of what you're saying, because, you know, research really shows that um, academic self-efficacy is highly important to the success and is like a significant to success to our students and is a significant predictor of like overall academic performance, right? And so our, our students' ability to feel successful and capable is really important. And I feel like the, the approaches you're both taking allow for those opportunities. One like a, additional piece, you know, from what I've uh, experienced is, you know, that ability to also model. Um, so I, I'm someone that will speak very openly. Uh, like I'll say things like, you know, um, people call me a doctor, but no one knows what my undergraduate or graduate school experience was, and it, and it wasn't linear. And sometimes when I say that, I got to remind myself of that too, because, um, you know, students have these belief systems in, in their, their head. And so when things that are up here all of a sudden are being communicated immediately and almost mitigates shame, which is such a dangerous emotion, um, or feeling like in ineffective or insecure, um, but like being able to establish like you are both doing uh, uh, classes and environments that really foster curiosity, asking questions as actually, you know, uh, a necessity to success and, and not a, a reflection of, of not being intelligent or something like that is really great. Someone asked in the chat about suggestions um, about graduate students and how would you manage approaching a professor who is making a space feel unsafe and not inclusive? Go ahead. Yeah, okay. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, there, there's only so much, like systems take a long time to change. Um, I remember doing a whole imposter phenomenon workshop my first year here um, in a uh, graduate uh, uh, department that shall not be named. Um, and it included both the graduate students and the professors within that department. Um, and it was very interesting to see the immediate like calm that came over many of those graduate students when we were openly talking about how they were all like, I, I experienced that too. And like, you know, I, I feel so insignificant next to my professor and this sort of thing. And then, then one of the, the professors really speaking to like, well, this is how it is. Like, this is, this is how it, and, and like, as though that should be like an accepted norm. And so the fact is, whether we are in graduate school or outside of graduate school, we are going to experience situations and circumstances like that. Um, so what I really encourage, because um, sometimes even with our best efforts um, and utilization of our voice is not necessarily going to change the culture of that particular classroom or change the presentation of that particular professor. Um, but those are the times that I really uh, encourage students to find their people. <laughs> um, find your people. I, I think oftentimes we are students like to step out of the box and like, but as Lisa Marie was identifying very early on, every day it's stepping out of your box like there's not necessarily people that you're interacting with that you always will see yourself in um and so i think in, in graduate school those things are going to happen those things are going to happen in life it is important to actually find those uh, individuals those communities that you do see yourself in because it's during those times we need others to be able to see us and sometimes hold that mirror up when we cannot um, and so um, that that connection and that community, 
I think is what helps um, us kind of move through those experiences that could really feel, um, you know, degrading or, or, or challenging. Uh, I guess to add to that, so you're talking about, Danielle, what, finding your people. Uh, I call it mentors. I tell my students, you can never have enough mentors. <laughs> so I just told my research student yesterday that there are certain mentors that are really good for helping you figure out your class schedule. And there are really good mentors for helping you figure out how to navigate data interpretation. And there are really good mentors for figuring out uh, how to fit in on Stony Brook campus. And there are really good mentors for figuring out how you're going to uh, pay the bills and write your resume for that job that you need over the summer. And there's, a, you know, so, and I told her about all the mentors I've had. I probably have 40 mentors minimum <laughs> that all serve different purposes. And I even found among faculty, um, there was this, senior faculty member. She's a full professor. Um, she's at another school, but I was talking to her about this award I was going to apply to. She said, oh, you're going to apply to that award? I said, yes, I fit the criteria. And I said, I looked up the criteria. I fit it. This is my plan, my strategy on how I'm going to get it. These are, you know, how I'm going to do this and navigate this. And she said, oh, well, I could do that too. And then she applied, she like went full force. She like had this whole thing. She went and applied to like three different awards because she had all the material. It just had never occurred to her to do this. And so I just feel like you can never be too old. You can never be too experienced. I have to say that it came, that attitude has grown on me <laughs> the years. I don't think I thought I needed a mentor when I was younger. I thought that everybody just did it by themselves because it seemed like everyone did it by themselves. And so I guess as I've gotten older, that's one thing that I've learned is that I can use all the help I can get. Anyone that's willing to give it to me. <laughs> Great, I also see there is a reflection from our audience shared a, a way to, um, help students feel welcome is to introduce themselves with a personal story. Yeah, so this is a very useful strategy. So make it uh, you uh, more approachable to your students. Um, anyone want to add up to the previous question? Well, I'll just say, uh, you know, again, I'm I'm going across campus talking about mental health and the importance of it. and. And that sort of thing. And so another one of the things that I, I will uh, will say, kind of similar to what we're, we're bringing up here is, um, and it immediately, I think, helps connect the room. I'll be like, you know what? I um, come from a very traditional Italian family. We have no mental health issues. And like people who are like, recognize that that's ridiculous. They will laugh, right? Um, others are like shocked by it. And then I'll be like, no, actually there's a ton, right? Um, and so just just that, right there. Now, all of a sudden, it's okay to talk about something that maybe I've never talked about before, like, um, because, you know, we all have mental health and uh, similar to our physical health, we have to take care of it. And and so I, I think to that point, um, and in some like presentations, workshops, things I do, um, providing that level of authenticity is helpful because again, our students are often like uh, in this question, comparing themselves to achievements rather to humans um, and and recognizing that as humans, uh, we uh, the one thing that is connecting us all is that we are all imperfect. Um, and it was those imperfections or those perceived failures that actually maybe opened doors or led us in a different direction. And I, I think um, that type of authentic narrative is really helpful. Yeah, thank you. So we have a question for all of you. Uh, do you feel the, oh, okay. So, well, let me just pause here. There is a question for Mariah. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, I think it's just a comment, right? Um, thank you, um, Mili, uh, if I pronounce that right, um, about a warm attitude and modeling behaviors. Um, so I, but I guess along the lines of what Danielle was talking, I have two things that I tell my students. Usually I tell them the failure story. So after the first exam, this year I did the whole like, you know, I don't know your grades thing. But last year I did the story of me failing this class. So I told them about my endeavor to be a math major and how I had been this math superstar and I thought I was so awesome. And then I went into the class and I stopped my year and I failed the first three exams. And about how I had to get back up on the horse and what helped me get back up on the horse and um, how I eked out a B plus somehow and um, you know just sort of that struggle sometimes. So sometimes I tell that story. Um, I think they liked to know that their professor failed at one point. And then <laughs> the other thing I tell them is um, stories about, about the human component. Sometimes I tell them stories about my life. So I have a son, he just went off to college and I tell him things like, I tell them things like, so I'm sure you all know how to do laundry. I said, my son is off at college and he thought that that little jug that I gave him was enough, but it wasn't. And you know what I mean? They kind of laugh and they, they're like, oh yeah, we have to do laundry too. And we talk about like the little pods I bought him and how um, privileged he is that he gets those little pods because, you know, his mother bought him pods and what they're made of. And then we talk about the chemical structure of the pods and how they're biodegradable. But like, you know, I just sort of use some of these lifelong things to say, you can do laundry and I know you can do laundry and then talk about something that's very real to them and then how chemistry is involved. I don't know, just whatever your topic is, talking about how it relates um, to their regular lives is really important. I think that helps them feel more a part of the conversation, anything that they can hold on to you know, to join. Can I just quickly add, sorry, Mariah, there's something like I, there was a student I spoke to um, uh, through a Let's Talk, it was a graduate student uh, and they were in, and so Let's Talk are these like brief contacts. They were in significant distress. Um, and the more I uh, kind of asked questions at what the distress was, uh, was concerned because they were about to take their first exam within their area. Um, and throughout their high school and undergraduate career, they sailed through academically. Um, and this person was also, um, you know, identified as female in a very male dominated uh, field. And they were experiencing significant anxiety with these upcoming exams because this is the first time that they actually had to study um, and now they question, like, am I going to be able to to get the grade that I always can get, right? And and so I just think it's important too, like, for us to think back to our earlier experiences as well, because oftentimes, again, there, there's so much that is culturally informed in our intersectional pieces, but then also we're dealing with young adults, which is somewhere between the ages of you know, 14 to 27. It's a large range, um, and oftentimes they have put a lot of their identity um, and belief in themselves in one, one bowl or one pocket. Sometimes these are first gen students, right? Like that have a, a lot that they're carrying for their families and, their, um, and how fragile that could be. Uh, so I, I think uh, having these conversations, ha having models like this early on too are, are so, so important because, you know, we're, we're working with very high achieving young people. Um, and I'll often say that I'm like, you are not here by mistake. No one got here by mistake. Um, and, and challenge that right off the bat. Um, so, because I think our tendency is always to see the negative, but the fact is no matter what it looked like to get where they got, they got there. And so there's resiliency factors there. There are things that are within them, um, that are getting them to a place that not many can get to. Um, so I just want to put that out there. <laughs> Thank you for addressing the, the question. Um, 
for the first generation students. So how do you feel like um, if uh, student IP uh, impact different group of students differently? Uh, I mean the underrepresented group of students. Are they are some of them more vulnerable to IP or not? Anyone want to share your observation or ideas about that? Lisa Marie, do you you're nodding and I, I feel like our personalities are maybe over bearing, so <laughs> I just want to your turn. Okay. I will say that I do think it impacts different groups very differently. And it definitely, um, okay, so for example, immigrant from the Caribbean, for me, being a scientist is not a thing. There's no such thing as a scientist in my home country. And every time I meet somebody from my home country, I get the question, well, why do you want to be a scientist? And I always have to explain the significance of, of doing science and the fact that science is literally integrated into every aspect of our life for them to recognize the importance of science and what scientists can do and have continued to do for our society in general, right? So you have, you can have a situation like that, or you can have a situation where you can have a person who's URM, who's from, who's first gen, where they have absolutely nobody in their family who's ever done um, a particular career path. And so they don't have anybody to turn to, to ask questions. And it, to echo you know, Mariah's point of having mentors, building a support network for yourself, you know, you can do that with respect to having professors, but you also can do that with respect to having peers as well. So that's one of the reasons why I've tried to work to build, have the students focus on peer community building, because it, it really helps them when they have people who are closer in their age um, range, who they can turn to and ask questions and get some additional advice. Like, believe it or not, like you want to turn to a professor, sometimes it's quite uncomfortable because there is no personal connection. There's an age gap. The life experiences are very different. The cultural experience could be very different. And so, you know, peer mentorship, I think is important, but also building that mentor network is also important um, just so that those people can have additional people there to support them and provide them with the tools and point them in the right direction that they may need to go. So they're not aware of how to navigate becoming a a person who is a scientist or a person who has a medical degree. Now you need somebody to turn to, to ask these specific questions to, right? And even having those conversations about, okay, this is where I'm at. This is where, this is where I see myself. These are the skill sets that I think that I have. Do you agree, right? Because you also need people in your life who can, so to speak, I guess, keep you in check, but also provide you different perspective and also help you, um, envision having a, a, a goal and a dream and a path for yourself, right? It's important to have that that network. So that's how I would say helping, you know, people from URMs with imposter phenomenon, even people from first gen, um, you know, it's, it's always very interesting from my perspective. Like I, people, at least for me, what I've experienced growing, you know, coming to this, this, this country and going through um, the college system is that I've met students who, you know, in some respects, they don't recognize their privilege, right? Because the hidden curriculum that I have to face as an international student, for example, or international scholar, where, you know, in an American culture, there are certain things that are understood, there are certain nuances that are, you know, there that people already get because they grew up here. And so they understand it. But then me coming here, I'm just like, I don't get this. I don't understand this. And then, when I have those conversations with them to try and understand that perspective, I get told, well, how come you don't know this? I'm just like, because I wasn't born in this country. So I don't understand these nuances. So you have that extra sort of privilege that I think is not necessarily discussed. And when sometimes it gets discussed, people become uncomfortable because they feel as though, you know, you're telling them that they're biased when in fact, you're just trying to tell them, no, you know, think a little bit more broadly when it comes to people from literally diverse backgrounds, everybody has completely different life experiences and there's some things you're gonna get and some things you're not gonna get. And so trying to work to normalize things, normalize people's different experiences and also provide them with resources so that they can then clue themselves in and build up their self-efficacy in, in many respects, which would then 
feed into their self-confidence and feed into their success. I think those are like the strategies that should be prioritized when it comes to like really trying to help people from URM and, you know, different backgrounds deal with imposter phenomenon and work through it. So, but yes, the short answer is yes, it does affect people from diverse backgrounds very differently. I guess I want to say two things. One on Lisa Marie and her peer mentoring. So there's a program here at Stony Brook that Peter Gergen in undergraduate biology initiated, and it's called Inspire. And he takes experienced research students, like senior students, and he pairs them with students that are like freshmen or sophomores that don't know what the research experience is like. And these are often from underrepresented groups or um, from financially disadvantaged backgrounds. And so um, this peer mentor helps them see what this process is like and makes it more accessible. Um, oh, and there was another one. Oh, and then as, um, as someone who isn't um, maybe on the peer level, so you can make environments for students to come together and find themselves structures for students to find themselves and find their people to help that. And then also as someone, because um, I think most people on this call are older, so, and not students, but, um, but you can also anticipate, like try to put your, sometimes this is what I do. I try to put myself in the perspective of that student. Where are they coming from? Who are their parents? What's their family environment like? And then I try to think about what, things might they not know that I think are part of being successful. And I try to tell them these things without them soliciting the information. I just sort of put it out there as this, I'm just giving you information. And then they can ask when they feel more comfortable about particulars. But I just try to anticipate, I guess, as an instructor, what they might want to know about being a successful professional. Thank you. We have uh, one last question. Since almost everyone experienced IP at some point, so how do you think experiencing IP is relevant to your teaching and um, everyone else? Yeah. You already partially addressed this, but yeah, if there's more to add on to this question. Please, thanks. Okay, so I can go first. I think upon experiencing IP, I think it just drives home the point of making your classroom environment more inclusive, working to make it a safe and inclusive space so that students now can come and can not just work on being successful with respect to course content mastery, but also work on becoming successful within themselves, right? Building the additional skill sets that they need to navigate the classroom space, to navigate their academic careers, to navigate life, and to be properly equipped to deal with IP because it's something that, like we've all said, it's a, it's, it's a constant process. You're always working at it. And as you move from one aspect of your career to another, you may you will face it again, right? And so it's about having the right tools to be able to do the self-assessment to recognize, okay, I'm currently facing this. I need to now remind myself, I need to go talk to my, my mentors and my mentor network to you know, get some additional advice, get some additional perspective for how I can properly navigate the situation so that it doesn't hinder me from being further successful. I'm gonna join like the last question in, into this question because um, the question of like, are there certain uh, underrepresented groups that might experience IP um, kind of goes back to what I, I was saying in the beginning, because we do know as it relates to like graduate students and college students that feelings of uh, imposter phenomenon are more predictive uh, of, of stress and mental health problems than actual one's minority status. And so that's really important because and I, again, I think that this has been a narrative I'm, I'm hearing as Mariah and Lisa Maria are also speaking. And, and, and with my experiences, 
when you're coming from a place that is different, right? There is difference uh, that is, is is seen even, um, and you're you're going into a system. Um, there's going to be a constant feeling that, um, and I hear this from students all the time, you know, and um, and have experienced just being a, a woman sometimes in male dominated um, areas that you have to prove something more, you know, you, you like, and, and that if there was a, a question or something that you see is not up to par with whomever you're comparing yourself, that that feels more detrimental to your sense of self. So um, I, I do think that anyone that's coming from a, a place of, of difference in language, um, in race, ethnicity, culture, it, it is going to come up against the, the systems that have been created. Um, and so that is why um, you know, the, our ability uh, in our areas to both uh, create that space that allows opportunities for students to learn in the different ways that they learn, um, you know, to uh, ask questions and perhaps approach things in a different way than maybe we've imagined. Um, I think that's really important, right? Like, how do we actually create a, a safe learning environment where our students are being curious um, rather than feeling like, you know, if they say something wrong or this sort of thing that they're going to be seen in a certain way. Um, so, you know, for me, as it relates to IP, I really do think um, our systems and, you know, us as individuals in our systems, it really, the onus really lies on us uh, to kind of help create the pathways, um, the spaces and the places uh, for our students to kind of really excel and reach their potential. I feel like it's my turn, but I'm not entirely sure what to say. Sorry, Jenny. <laughs> what did you want me to address? No, it's okay. You, as I said, you already passionately addressed this. So this is fantastic. Thanks all. And uh, I just want to share a slide of uh, some um, practice uh, summarized by the Brown University. Hold on. Uh, There we go. I know it's hard to read, but yeah, you all of you covered some of these um, topics over there. And uh, like um, a model by your own and also promote a growth mindset and the student community. And uh, yeah, some of them like uh, ask students, talk them about their own value, self-validate. So these are all very useful strategies. And uh, for our audience, if there's anything you want to add to, you can just uh, um, either unmute yourself or just uh, type in the chat. We can start wrapping up now. We have five minutes left. Um, Devin just um, included the link to the LibGuide again for all of you. We have um, a lot of good resources available. Um, thank you again for our panelists for um, making the time today and providing great, great insights. This was really helpful and informative. And um, I really enjoyed listening to all of the discussions as well. Um, I wanted to express some special thanks to our director, Rose Tarota Esposito, for always supporting our inclusive teaching panel discussion. Also, Elizabeth Newman, our vice provost for curriculum and undergraduate education, and of course, all of our self teammates as well. If you have any other questions, um, you can email Dr. Carol Hernandez. She's um, coordinating all of our um, amazing inclusive teaching panel discussion. And we also have a survey link that I'm just going to put in the chat right now. Um, we, in, we really welcome all of your feedback. So please fill out our survey. It will be very helpful for all of us. Um, thank you again for being here, all of our participants and our panelists. Um, I will stick around a little longer in case anyone has any other additional comments or questions. But thank you, everyone. Thank you.
Thank you everybody for coming.